Every film is the product of the films and directors and cinematographers that came before it, and three of last year's biggest pictures are perfect evidence of that. Let's start with Barbie from director Greta Gerwig. She's gone on record as citing a number of classic films being inspiration to her during the making of the film. Just look at the opening sequence and its clear homage to Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. There's also the Ken Ballet sequence, which draws clear inspiration from 1952's Singing in the Rain, where Gene Kelly and Sid Charisse perform their own dreamy ballet set against a similar color palette. But there are more subtle references too. For example, the array of cutout dream houses in Barbie Land bear a strong resemblance to the sets of 1961's Jerry Lewis vehicle, The Ladies' Man, as well as Hitchcock's life-sized apartment complex from Rear Window. There's also the Saturday Night Fever-like disco scene, and the reverse Wizard of Oz journey that Barbie and Ken take as they travel from the technicolor wonder of Barbie Land to the more muted and dreary real-world L.A. Check out Daniela Gama's great article on Collider for more ways in which Barbie borrowed from her old Hollywood ancestors. Up next is The Holdovers, directed by Alexander Payne and starring Paul Giamatti as a disgruntled history teacher at a New England boarding school in 1970. First of all, this film isn't just superbly written, directed, and acted. It also depicts a world that feels lived in. Part of that is due to the characters, who don't feel like two-dimensional stereotypes of their respective generations. It's also due in part to the sets. The fictional Barton Academy was created by filming at five real schools in Massachusetts. Other locations included historic theaters and the Boston Common. There's the method in which The Holdovers was filmed as well. It looks like it was made in 1970, from the sets, to the costumes, even to the opening credits. This feels like the not-so-distant cousin to films like Harold and Maud and Class of 44. What's interesting to note is that according to Payne and cinematographer Igel Brild, very little had to be done to the locations to make them look and feel old. Payne was quoted as saying, change comes slowly to New England. Another big movie of 2023 was Saltburn. And though it was polarizing, it blended together a number of motifs and styles from classic cinema, most notably Alfred Hitchcock, F.W. Murnau's Nosferatu, and Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. This is the story of voyeurism, like the kind seen in Hitchcock's Rear Window, as well as homoerotic overtones between the two main characters, as in Rope. Next, the film features a pretty overt nod to the Overlook Hotel in The Shining. This hedge maze, which is where one of the more shocking events of the film occurs, but let's watch this scene of Oliver's arrival to Saltburn, where he's given the tour of the house. It's more subtle in its homage, but it isn't just meant to convey the layout of the house to Oliver. It's also meant to give the audience the lay of the land. This kind of tracking shot where we're traveling through endless hallways is reminiscent of one of the most recognizable shots in Kubrick's film. As for Nosferatu, in a recent article in The Wrap, cinematographer Linus Sandgren was quoted as saying, I asked Emerald for words to describe the film, and she said vampire. She also said hair, sweat, details like that. There were all kinds of words that got us into quickly thinking it'll be interesting if we thought of it like a vampire movie, even though it's not real vampires, but it's in a similar vein. He specifically cited Nosferatu and German Expressionism. Oliver isn't a literal vampire, but he seems to drain the people around him. He's like a curse that slowly takes hold of the people inside the house. It's important as we watch and study the films coming from today's filmmakers that we also supplement our movie-going experience with the works that inspired them. Do you need to watch Hitchcock's entire filmography to understand Saltburn? No, but watching a few key films might give you a better understanding of why a director filmed a certain scene that way, just like you don't need to watch every 1940s adventure serial to enjoy Raiders of the Lost Ark. But a little homework can go a long way into appreciating the work being done today. The films of 50, 60, 70, even 100 years ago are still just as relevant and important today as they were back then. Don't forget about them. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The show is about to begin. And welcome to our first live show of the 2024. And uh, I want to uh, welcome everyone that is joining in tonight. Uh, welcome to the show. And uh, please, we, we welcome your comments, your questions, anything you want to say, say it within reason. Uh, but today I have the honor of having a special guest. He's been on before and he's returning. And that is the man, the myth, the legend, Harry Marks from Let's All Go to the Lobby. 
Hello, thanks for joining. Badass, I, I forgot how badass that opening is. I feel like I should be walking out, you know, in the WWE. <laughs> With fireworks behind you and, and, uh, and fire. Um, thanks so much for joining me tonight. I know we, we plan on doing this a week ago, but my mic ended up dying, and I had to replace my mic, and it took me yep. almost a week to finally get a replacement mic. Um, but we're here now, so thanks so much for joining me tonight. And um, I thought we would go ahead and talk a little bit about what you do on your social media platforms and YouTube, because obviously, as the opening of this video showed, kind of gives you a glimpse of what kind of stuff you do. Obviously, you have a passion for film, passion for filmmaking, and I really love the stuff you do. So if you want to take it away and kind of explain uh, what you do to the audience and where they can find you. Thank you. Um, yeah, absolutely. So I am primarily on TikTok, though I also am on Instagram. I do have a YouTube presence. I am not really focusing there. Um, after the first of the year, I sort of reassessed where I was spending a lot of my time and, and what was worth my time. And unfortunately, the kind of content I've been putting out just doesn't seem, sorry, I'm getting over COVID from last week, um, doesn't seem made for YouTube. It doesn't seem like the right kind of content for YouTube. It's short form. It's all vertically shot mostly. Well, not, it's mostly vertically shot. Um, and it just seems better suited for the short form content platforms like Instagram and TikTok. So that's where I'm focusing. And my primary goal is classic film history, old Hollywood education. Um, I just put out a video yesterday about the history of uh, drive-in theaters. So I run the gamut. I span all of you know classic Hollywood as much as I can. Um, I primarily started the account or, or the channel uh, talking, um, doing classic film intros like you would find on Turner Classic Movies. So you watch TCM, and before the movie, there's always an introduction of the film, um, you know, about the making of the film, the socio-political climate during the, the time of the film. Um, and so that leads you into making, into the film itself. And it, I really started it as a way to honor what I love so much about TCM, which is the intro. That's my favorite part, even more than the movies, is learning about the movies. So that's how I started. And then from there, it just sort of snowballed into all this other stuff. Well, like I said, I, I love your content. Uh, and I first found you when I started TikTok, I think a little over a year ago. And I stumbled upon your, your, uh, your, 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 what do you call it? What, what, I don't know what they call it, channel, whatever they call it on TikTok. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because when I first started my account, I didn't really know what I wanted it to be. And then I had this like epiphany moment of like, no, I know what I want it to be. And this is what it, and now it's going to be. It went from a generic, like Harry's TikTok account to a branded channel. And over the last year, we're coming up on about a year. I think it was February when I pivoted officially to let's all go to the lobby. Um, it's, it's turned into this whole thing now. Um, and I've met so many amazing people like yourself and um, low bearing beams podcast and uh, Miss Waif is in the chat right now. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's been fantastic. Also, merch plug. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. You got a merch merch uh, going on, uh, which I wanted to talk to you about, about a little bit more about, but off the air. But if you guys mm -hmm. uh, love to merch and want to support Harry, uh, where can they find your, your merch at? Uh, so if you go to Linktree, uh, it's linktr.ee slash hcmarks. Um, that is where you can find my um, all the links to my stuff, but my Etsy store is on there. Um, and that's where you'll find links to buy... Um, these mugs i've got sweatshirts i've got stickers um i'm gonna get t-shirts up there soon so there's some cool stuff to buy nice nice um i'm i'm being told that your volume's a little too low is there a way to adjust that yeah so guys what we're going to focus on on this show well first of all go better? follow harry go go let, go follow harry <laughs> I'm gonna put the links of your ch your channel and your TikTok stuff um, at the after this um, live show is done. Uh, but is it what is your TikTok and social media uh, handle? So I am on TikTok at Lobby Intros, um, uh, one word, and then Instagram. I believe I am underscore uh, Lobby underscore Intros. I couldn't get Lobby Intros on Instagram, so it's Lobby okay. underscore Intros. Okay, and and you are you on YouTube, but you don't do 
too much i'm on youtube i i wouldn't really go there to like keep up to date with my stuff i i will be posting more on there as i get around to it but it's not my focus yeah yeah well i I tell you by the way oh yeah yes it's much better okay yeah yeah, well, I tell you, I, I loved your intros because me and you have something in common where we love classic film. And we have we both have a lot of knowledge of film, classic film, filmmaking. And so I really gravitated towards your, your intros because, as you said, it, 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 it reminded me of the old TCM intros that I used to watch, you know, when I was a teenager in the 90s and into the 2000s. And nobody does that anymore. And in fact, as we all know, Warner Brothers, they, they try to get rid of TCM altogether, which... They they laid off a bunch of stuff. I mean, the, the channel is still doing them. They've got a, a group of great hosts. They've got Dave Carger, who just released a new book about the Oscars. Um, ben Mankiewicz. Um, uh, is Alicia Malone Alicia still there? Malone. Yeah. Alicia Malone is there. Um, Eddie Muller does the noir stuff. Um, so they've got a fantastic group of, of hosts who still do the intros. But yeah um david zaslov tried to nuke tcm they, they really it was the behind the scenes stuff like the the producers and i think one of the head executives of tcm they tried to get rid of them and there was such pushback because i don't think he realized the dedicated fan base that that channel has um there was so much pushback from from not just us but also steven spielberg wes anderson um or not wes anderson i think pt anderson paul thomas anderson yeah. um and uh scorsese um, that he was sort of forced to retract everything. He brought people back, and I think he's leaving it alone. He knows better, but yeah, it was it was touch and go for a while. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when I first heard that announcement, I was floored. I was like, ah. yeah. It, to me, it just shows that these executives and these people that own these studios they don't understand or care about what it means to preserve film, to cultivate film, and all they look at is what's there now and the future and their bankroll that's all they care right. about they, they just see dollar signs and you know before we get into the main topic i i do want to say like i don't think a lot of people understand how integral turner classic movies is to classic film it's not just a channel they do mm -hmm. active preservation work to restore classic films um they work with scorsese and he's got his um i think uh international classic film restoration program as well um, but like Giant starring, um, uh, I almost well, Rock, blank. Rock Hudson, Rock Hudson and, and James Dean. Um, they restored that. Um, they do a ton of work to preserve classic film. It's not just about airing them. Um, it really is a, a labor of love for, for the people who work there to make sure that, you know, these films are saved and these, these careers are saved. We've lost so many film careers over the years due to just negligence and fire and all sorts of disaster yeah 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 i mean like i said i remember um watching tcm when i was a, a young teenager with my dad and i remember well actually this goes with uh miss is it miss wolf uh waif uh where, where she asked is there a specific tcm intro that stands out in your memory for any reason and what the first thing I can think of is Frankenstein, the original mm -hmm. 1939, I believe, Frankenstein. And that, that's when I clearly remember sitting and watching with my dad and just being intrigued by the intro and the outro as well. I think Robert Osborne did those. And yeah. Bob Osborne did almost all of them in the beginning. I think it was really just him uh, to start. Yeah. The channel launched April 14th, 1994. The first film they ever showed was Gone with the Wind. And that's the one that sticks out to me the most because the intros almost didn't deviate at all and haven't deviated since that first one. They are still very much the same introductions with always, always with new facts. They always redo them every couple of years to keep them fresh, but the format has never changed. It's one person talking to the camera, teaching you about a film. Yeah, exactly. And that's what I love about it. Um, and like you were, what we were saying, uh, because TCM has worked with Criterion, they've worked with BFI, the British yep. Film Institute. They've worked with a number of, of different institutions to preserve uh, a film restoration. In fact, real quick, before we dive into this other question here, um, I am sending you something that's coming out the end of January. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I'm sending you this is because I know you are going to love it. I love this movie, and it, it's been banned for like 40 or 50 years until a couple years ago when Criterion first released on DVD. Then it went out of print, and I've been waiting for it to come out again. 
And finally, BFI is re-releasing Peeping Tom on 4K UHD. And this is a film that has some really rich history here. Um, It ruined the director's career Mm -hmm. um, because of the content matter. Um, And going back to Scorsese, whoops, that's the wrong one. Uh, Going back to Scorsese, let me see if I can find it here. Going back to Scorsese, um, where is it? Peeping Tom is Uh, great. It's like someone asked the question, you know, would you like it if Psycho was more effed up? Here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, like, like what made me and my brother Simon want to watch it is because we saw an interview with Martin Scorsese. And it's one of his favorite films. And and he helped to um, restore it for with Criterion. In mm-hmm. fact, there's there's an intro on the Criterion uh, DVD with him. And he was he was saying that if you think Psycho was great, you haven't seen anything until you've seen Peeping Tom. Oh yeah, and um, and uh, well, so that's that's why we we sought it out, and I was blown away by it because it's, talk about a subject matter that was way ahead of its time. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people think Psycho was, but this was even even more so. And uh, Scorsese helped to restore the film in 4K, and kind of uh, guided it, everything along the way, spearheaded it. And uh, it comes with some really uh, good uh, new special features of interviews and so on. So I'm that's right now. That's my most anticipated release. Um, it's only available in the UK, uh, so you have to import it. And I import it from Diabolic DVD. Um, and it does come with a Blu-ray. I know you don't have a 4K player, right? I do. Oh, you do? Okay, I thought I you do. Didn't. I just got one um, a couple months ago on Black Friday. Oh. They were having a deal, so I snagged one. Nice. Okay, good. So you can watch on 4K. I'm, I'm so sure excited. it's going to be beautiful. Um, but let's get to the question here. It says, Ash B says, I know this is a very general question, but what is your favorite classic film? That you is, uh, yeah, oops. That is, wait a minute, hold on here. Where's the chat? Yeah, I'm trying to close the chat here. <laughs> um, that is, uh, those type of questions about what is your favorites, I I hate answering them. And the reason why I hate answering them, same reason I don't like doing top 10 or top five is because there's, there's just too many. It's so vast. And it's like, as soon as I say one, then I'm going to think, Oh wait, no, wait, this one. Well, no, wait, this one. No, I like this one. And so I don't like answering those questions or top five, give, give like a ranking. I don't really like doing that. Um, you know, off the top of my head, I think the classic Universal Monsters is definitely up there. Um, let's see. I don't know. Maybe you can think of a couple and jog my memory of some others. So the one that um, always comes back to that, that I always come back to is um, Sweet Smell of Success. Um, yes. Tony Curtis, uh, Burt Lancaster. Uh, it is one of the best scripts ever filmed. It is just... It's a it's a, it's a banger for lack of a better word. I mean, it really is just one of the most phenomenal, um, coolest scripts ever filmed. Um, right up there with I think Steven Soderbergh's Ocean's Eleven remake. Um, it's full of like slang and from like 1950s slang. It's a it's beautifully shot. Um, it's it's a like a perfect film noir. And there's no death in it. It's it's not that kind. It's not like Laura or. Um, or uh, third man or anything like that, but it's it is just a it's the the seedy underbelly of the New York entertainment scene, and it's just stunning. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's definitely a good one, um, and I'm hoping that I'm see these are the type of films I'm hoping they they at least get a 4K. I'm not even sure if that's on that Blu-ray. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I mean, if I, I heard that Gone with the Wind was announced in, to be released in 4K, but I haven't heard any more about that. Um, so you return the disc has a good one. Uh, what are some of your favorite silent films? You go and take that one first. I mean, I always go back to the, the classics cabinet of Dr. Caligari, um, Metropolis, um, Phantom of the Opera, the, the Lon Chaney version, um, which was originally supposed to be <clears throat> remade a couple of uh, years later as a talkie. When, when those finally hit the scene, they had tried to bring everybody back to record lines to be, 
um, spoken. There was a new score that was recorded for it, but it never got off the ground. Lon Chaney was sick by that time, and he was off filming another movie. It was one of his last films, I think. Um, he was already very sick, and he just he couldn't get to the studio to record his lines. So they never did anything with it, and I don't know whatever happened to the footage. It's probably lost forever. Um, but I would have loved to have seen, you know, the talking version of the Phantom of the Opera. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I've um, you mentioned Cabinet of Caligari, which I got a yep. uh, the Eureka 4K box oh, set there. That's gorgeous. I think I've shown it before, and uh, a couple other ones. Um, this is one I've shown before, and I think we talked about it last time you we were on, and that is uh, Howard Hughes' Hell's Angels. Oh, yeah. And um, I believe that's a silent. Was that silent? I don't know. <laughs> Wings <laughs> I are remember. silent. I don't know. Yeah, I just, yeah, my brain just went, wait, is it? Yeah, it's a silent. So... And this is another one that Martin Scorsese says that he is one of his favorite films, and he actually watches it every single time before he goes into production for a film, uh, for motivation, inspiration. Well, and another one where Hughes was in the plane filming them, right? Like they were doing yeah. real dog fights in the air. They they show that in the Aviator when um, the making of that film. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was actually on the wing of the plane shooting. Yeah, uh, it's insane. And now the two classics, Metropolis and Nosferatu. Oh, and um, these are from Kino Lorber. And uh, so those are a couple of, of favorites of mine. Um, let's, we're going to go to a couple of the comments here, and then we'll dive into more about physical media. I, I want to talk uh, uh, John Pemble's thing here, because it actually speaks to something I'm working on for next week, um, which is what we constitute a classic film. And I agree. Cla when... When um, T TCM hit the airwaves in 94, they were showing movies from the 50s and the 60s, and you're talking 20, 30 years away from when they first started the channel. So today, a classic film could be a film from 2000, from 1995, and I'm doing a series of intros on modern classics. So, um, spoiler alert, and it's on my channel anyway, there's a teaser of it. So I'm doing five films that where uh, the focus is music. So I'm doing That Thing You Do, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, Almost Famous. Um, uh, oh, crap, I blanked on the last two. Uh, <laughs> um, oh, Chicago, and then I can't remember what the other one is. It's on. It's in my teaser. Um, so Chicago from 2000, the, the musical adaptation uh, from Candor and Ebb. Um, so, you know, those are technically classic films i mean if we're if we're doing it like a car where it's like 25 years we're getting to that point with a lot of these movies and they're technically classic films and it's weird to me to go on tcm especially on the app and scroll through and see like this one's from 2000 this movie's from 2005 or 2009 yeah. and it's like oh my god is this really a classic film now um yeah but yeah, yeah they are yeah I, I i was that's funny because uh yesterday i was actually thinking about that like i because i get to ask that too what constitute a classic film you know, is it 20 years, 30 years, 40 years? And there's people that are saying that Holdovers is a modern classic. Mm -hmm. So I don't think age really has anything to do with what the, what deeming classic. Um, it's, you know, it's it's the style of filmmaking it is. Uh, it is. I, I think so. You know, the, it the, is. And like, like, like I said in that video you showed at the beginning, the Holdovers, if the Holdovers was just a period film, I, I wouldn't think twice about it. But the fact that it was filmed as though it was made in 1968, 1969, and it looks like it was made in that time period, from the, the titles to the shots they did to just the sets and the costumes, the, the whole look of the film screams like it was made at the same time Harold and Maude was made. And to, the, to me, that evokes classic film. I mean, that is a modern classic if there ever was one. Yeah, and also, it, yes, it, it does demonstrate we are getting older. I don't like feeling <laughs> old. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm coming on 46 in March, and it's kind of like you're you're thinking, like, like when you mentioned that thing you do, that came in what 96, 96, yeah. Uh, I'm thinking, dang, it's been that long, almost 30 yeah. years now. That's yeah. They had a and, reunion and, during COVID, um, like a an online reunion, and the, the the band got back together for a little bit, and they did. I think right before COVID, they had a little like reunion together where they they performed because they had all learned their instruments to a degree so that they could fake it um convincingly on screen and there were times when um when they would stop the the backing track during the recording like during the the state fair sequences and the extras thought they were playing they, they thought yeah. they had been playing the whole time 
so they yeah. know how to play their instruments it's sort of like the monkeys they some of them knew already how to play some of them needed to learn how to play and by the time they finally got on stage or, or on film they knew what they were doing yeah exactly exactly uh, return of the disc has an uh, interesting point here he says um the casual viewer seems to think the film industry started in 19 or uh, uh what is it i can't read 1980 that. 19, if you get all your film news from TikTok, people think it started in 1999 with The Matrix, and it's just really <laughs> depressing when it's like, we're going to rank our top five directors, and it's always Scorsese, Nolan, Tarantino, uh, Villeneuve, or, you know, whoever's, like, hot right now, and it's like, how about Capra, Curtiz, um, you know, and any of the, these, these older David directors. Uh, Norman Jewison, who just died a couple of days yeah. ago, he directed Jesus Christ Superstar and Fiddler on the Roof. I mean, he's he was a big one, too, and, you know, we don't talk about them. Yeah, exactly. And that comes to my my mind just now when we're talking about this is I've seen time and time again on social media where people are saying that a movie that just came out or came out a few years ago, and they're saying um, that a movie that came out in like the 80s ripped off the movie that just was just released. Yeah. I can't think, I, right off the top of my head, I can't think of the, the titles right now, but I'm thinking, no, it's kind of reversed there. You know, they... Right ripped off what was made previously not the other way around because right. that movie didn't exist when they made it and, and a lot of times it's not even ripping off it's just paying them up we, you know we saw greta gerwig honor singing in the rain with barbie or um the ladies man you know with with the looks of the houses it, it's it's paying homage to what came before and greta gerwig has a, a, a fantastic film vocabulary she knows what she's doing um mm -hmm. which is we'll talk about this later but like it really upset me when she didn't get the nomination for best director so yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so your Ash B says here, hold on here. That's so nice. A little Thank accommodation you, so to you. Glad. I just wanted so, to say thanks to Harry. Let me read this here. I just wanted to say thanks yeah. to Harry because your intros inspired me to start watching more classic films. Um, your White Christmas intro made me watch it and I loved it. That's awesome. And see, that's what TCM did for me back in the day. It, it, you know, because, you know, when you're a teenager, you're not really gravitated towards older classic films. And you kind of have this mindset of, that's what my dad used to watch when he was a kid. I don't want to watch that. Mm -hmm. But, I, like I said, I sat down and watched these classic films with my, with my dad and the, the, the intros from Osborne. It made me love the movie even more so because of those intros. And you're doing the same thing here on social media. You're, you're inspiring people to actually seek out these movies and they watch a movie that they may not even thought of watching or think they would like, and they turn out to love it. And yeah. that's, I, it, it's TCM did that for me. And, you know, growing up with my parents, it's so funny because when my parents were kids, they listened to the Beatles or the Rolling Stones or, you know, the association. And so that's what I grew up listening to. And it's so funny because I'm in the car listening to, you know, early 2000s pop punk with my son in the back of the seat, like rocking out to Blink-182 because that's what I grew up listening to. It's so funny how things change, but I grew up in the house with TCM on, on almost all the time. Either my mom was watching something in the bedroom or my dad was watching something in the den. Um, so it was always just sort of floating around me, you know, all the time. And so that's how I grew up to love it. And I've been toying with the idea on my channel to do like, and if you liked series, so if you liked, you know, um, uh, what's the, uh, the Hateful Eight, you know, you might like The Magnificent Seven and sort of taking a modern film and juxtaposing it against a classic film for someone looking to broaden their horizons beyond what's just available right now. Yeah, exactly. Um, this way, so you, you bite your tongue. Blink-182 is not classic rock. I will not. Uh, <laughs> well, get this. You know, like I said, I'm going to be 46 in March. And I turn on the classic rock station and Def Leppard is playing. And I'm like, yeah, how, can that Day. Be, how can that be classic <laughs> rock? And then I'm like, well, okay, well, wait a minute. This song came out in 1982. So it's, you know, almost 40 years old. I guess that, cla that constitutes a classic. I don't know. But then Green Day, like you said, Green Day, Longview, Basket Case, those are being played on classic I rock. Re that I remember when Dookie came out and now I just feel terrible. <laughs> I'm terribly old. Oh, um, God. But Miss Waif did make a, a, a point here. Um, she says, uh, now, is Miss Waif, is that Anxious Hobbit? No. Different, no? Two different okay. 
Okay. Uh, it says, should we be uh, breaking classic films into subcategories like early or late? Just seems funny to lump films like Metropolis in the same category as Star Wars. Now, that brings me back to what I was saying earlier about how people are looking at these more modern films saying that they ripped off older, old, I mean, that, yeah, they, that they ripped off older films. That's what it, right there. Someone said Star Wars ripped off um, Seven Samurai. Or, and, and I mean, Sam, I'm sorry, Seven Samurai ripped off Star Wars. I had it reverse there. Seven Samurai ripped off Star Wars. And I had to make the Seven comment. Seven Samurai came out like 10 years earlier. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I'm making the comment. I'm like, do you realize the years difference there? <laughs> it, right. It's just, you know, the, the lack of knowledge is just, uh, you know, really gets me sometimes. It, it starts to turn into an echo chamber. And it, you're hearing this, about the same 12 movies from the same people all the time. And it just round and round we go. And that's, that's where, that's part of the reason I started my channel is because I found a niche I could squeeze myself into. Um, you know, where I could differentiate myself and also hopefully like I could talk about things. That's part of the problem with it, with a niche like this is that I'm one of like eight or nine people that I found at least, um, to talk about classic film in this kind of venue. Um, while everybody's talking about, you know, what just came out this week. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, I mean, we could talk about this for the rest oh, of the yeah. night, but <laughs> let's move on to physical media. Yeah. Let's uh, talk about physical media. I mean, this is called physical media coast to coast after all. Mm -hmm. Now we all know what's happened lately with, with Best Buy and they announced it uh, a few months ago and everyone's freaking out making like, you know, they just told them that they killed their cat or something. Uh, my, now my opinion here is this. Best Buy, yes, it had its place for physical media, especially with their limited editions and their their limited steel books. But when this news came out and and Best Buy is is deleting all their physical media, people are freaking out as if it's the only place where we ever could buy physical media from. Um, and I mean, sure, there's some people that do go to Best Buy to buy their physical media. Of course, there is. But, but I would say the majority of people didn't really buy from Best Buy unless it was like a limited edition steelbook or something like that. And most people gravitated towards Amazon, Walmart, you know, places like that. Most of all, because it was cheaper than Best Buy, because mm -hmm. Best Buy's prices went insane. Um, so I'm just curious to get your point of view on that. So I agree that the the... Sturm and Drong over Best Buy was a little overwrought because, like you said, nobody really bought at Best Buy. It was too expensive. The problem is that what happened, what Best Buy has done speaks to a wider trend throughout the industry. When we look at things like books or music, <coughs> you or I could start with the right capital, an independent bookstore, and we could sell books. Um, you know, we sort of, for the longest time, we collectively we as a, as a society sort of shunned Barnes and Noble because they were big brother compared to little independent bookstores. Then Amazon hit the market and suddenly Barnes and Noble is now the little guy and we're trying to defend them because if they go under, what chance do independent bookstores have? Same thing with music. Everything went to iTunes and then streaming and then um, there was a risk of losing physical music media. Um, and then suddenly vinyl took off again, and that turned into a big thing. And I, I have a feeling like cassette tapes are going to see a resurgence at some point, too. Um, but you, you know, we can go into a town and there's a record store there. And they're not just selling old records, used stuff, but they're selling new records as well. Movies don't have that. There is no small independent movie store that I know of that sells, you know, I walk in and I can buy Arrow Video or Kino or, you know, Criterion. Um, it's Best Buy, Barnes and Noble, Target, um, and then the others are, if it's not their websites, like the, the main websites, it's Amazon. And unfortunately, all of these companies are run by, or all of these, these imprints are run by companies that have streaming services. So, you know, for example, you can't buy the last two seasons of Stranger Things on DVD. You can buy the first two, but the last two are only on Netflix. And when Netflix we don't want this anymore and they toss it where does it go who gets it does anyone get it can anyone watch it ever again 
We've seen this with Zaslav on HBO and, and Max and all that. You know, they're tossing stuff. He he's made stuff that never saw the light of day. He's getting mm -hmm. rid of things to for the tax break and then not letting anyone else get it. I went on Netflix today and half of the DC universe is on yeah. on uh, Netflix now, like Shazam and Batman and all that stuff. It's bizarre. And so, you know, what happens when Best Buy stops selling physical media? My target went from an entire section of like eight, nine, ten shelves to an end cap. And even mm -hmm. that is like barely there. It's like whatever just came out on Tuesday and that's it. And then they shovel, shovel that off and then put replace it with something else. Um, so as those dry up, where do we go to buy our physical media? We will always have enthusiast imprints like Arrow and, and Vinegar Syndrome and all that. But without proper distribution channels, it feels like unless those smaller companies keep up the keep up the good work they've been doing, we're going to lose physical media, physical movie media. Now, um, you know, I, I've never really truly believed that physical media was dead. Um, and I've said this before on my channel. If you've watched my channel in the past, you know I've talked to death about, about my feelings towards it. It's never... I don't think it's dead and I don't think it's going to die. Um, and the reason being is because of one thing, labels like what you mentioned, uh, Criterion, Vinegar Syndrome, um, Second Sight right. in the UK, all these different sh shout factory, Kino Lorber. Now here's the thing. You see that you, you're seeing a lot of stu major studios like Paramount, Warner Brothers Universal licensing out their catalog to these boutique labels right. and they're releasing them. They're distributing them. Now for Kino Lorber, Shout Factory, they don't do their own restoration work. They send it out to a third party source to get restored or sometimes like Marathon Man, uh, Paramount restored it and then they hand it over to uh, Kino Lorber and then they do their own color grading. Now, to me, that shows that physical media is still really going it's alive it's well and the studios know it is and they see the value of physical media but then it also goes back to studios wanting you know looking out for their own interest as far as you know are we really making money just re-releasing marathon man no right. we're not we're not making money and so you they actually make much way more money licensing out their catalog than they would re, uh, uh, distribute it themselves. And that's exactly why David Zaslav started licensing out all these DC movies, all these movies over to Netflix, because he's making way more money doing that than just right. having it on Max, um, plus the tax benefits. But, exactly. going back to, but going back to physical media, it's, it's like um, we, we, we have... I do believe that the only places we're going to be able to buy physical media from is going to be online from Amazon. Uh, Walmart's taking over what Best Buy used to do with their limited edition steel books. Um, uh, I, I, I tend to gravitate towards diabolic DVD. Mm -hmm. um, they're really great. Flat $5 shipping takes two or three days for me to get something. And they, like today, they have, uh, uh, they, they had uh, The Abyss, True Lies, and Aliens 4K uh, for, up for pre-order. When Amazon doesn't have it up for pre-order yet. I don't know about Walmart. Um, and so I think our Orbit DVD is another place a lot of people like to go to. Those are the places that are going to keep selling physical media. Um uh, or if you have a place like Movie Trading Company or um, some kind of s franchise like that, Entertainment Mart, they will still sell physical media. But as these big, big box brick and mortar stores like Best Buy, yeah, it's gone because they don't see any value in it. Now, I will say, do you have any idea, any clue what Best Buy is replacing um, uh, uh, movies with? Because I found I found this out a, a, a couple weeks ago. So uh, a friend of mine, um, who's a who's a film producer, uh, and uh, his name is John Tom Thompson. We were talking about this, and he he told me he said that Best Buy is replacing all their movies with vinyl. Interesting. He, and the reason being is because they see more the vinyl's more lucrative than movies. 
it has a much wider audience because you have all these teenagers coming and buying vinyl. Uh, and he gave a good example, Taylor Swift. And he said, you know, you could buy Taylor Swift for 10 bucks on streaming, but yet people are going out of the way to buy the vinyl for 60 bucks. And that's what companies are seeing. And, and so he said that within the next few months or so, we're going to start seeing where the movies used to be. It's going to be all replaced with vinyl because it's more lucrative for them. It um, makes sense, but, but I... It's so funny because I don't, I don't see this working out for them. I, I think Miss Wave said it in the chat. Like, Best Buy is pretty much on the way out the door. I feel like they're going to go the way of Circuit City and, you know, Office Max and all of that. Because, Eventually, you know, yeah. If you need a computer, you're going to go – you're either going to go to the Apple Store, you're going to go online, you're going to buy it from directly from the, the manufacturer. You're not going to go to Best Buy and have the, you know, the 17-year-old read you the ticket from the shelf, you know, and tell you what's, you know, what's in the computer. Um, what else do they sell? Video games have gone digital almost entirely. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's, it's so hard. Physical media across the spectrum has just taken a shift towards streaming. And I got to tell you, I am frustrated as hell. I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. <laughs> um, I, I was trying to find a movie the other day that I could not, like, I, I was like, who has this? And I'm, I'm bouncing over to Peacock and Hulu. And like, it's funny as hell that I can go to Hulu and watch the Ted movies, but Peacock has the series. Um, right. It's just so bizarre. And like I on my, my link tree I have um links to I started putting in links to the the movies on Amazon of the intros I've done. And when I got to High Society from nineteen fifty five, the only Blu ray I could find was the one produced in Spain. It's a Spanish version. They never did an English version. So when is that coming? Is that ever coming? It's it's so f- bizarre and frustrating to me the and way then these, you these have... rights issues work. And then you have uh, movies like that where, are, okay, is it region locked? Or am I able right. to watch it on my region, you know, my region A Blu-ray player? If it's region right. locked, I can't watch it. Right. Well, like, we know 4K works on everything if you have a 4K player, but you have to have a 4K player. Yeah. 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 Uh, there's If you guys see this little open space here on the beside Harry, it's for these comments to come in. And... Uh, my eyesight must be really bad right now because I can't read them. <laughs> so um, if you can... I can say sales of modified 4K UHD drives are at record highs. I'd also say I think like PS5s are flying off the shelves because they're 4K players too. Um... Now here's now here's the thing. I do believe that physical media, as far as movies and people buying uh, 4K players or or whatever, a- has had a big resurgence. Uh, with uh, the pandemic yeah big resurgence um because there's a lot of places in the united states where they can't they don't have fast enough internet speed their internet speed isn't fast enough and or somebody a family that can't afford you know a hundred to a thousand mbps internet speed and yeah. there was an interview with the CEO of the ch- the Chicken Soup for the Soul company, which doesn't just produce the books. They now own Redbox, too. And he said the number it was like the number one um, venue for Redboxes are like the CVS in the middle of nowhere, Midwest America, because they don't have the kinds of high speed Internet that the coasts get. So that's how they get their new release movies. Same thing with AOL. There are millions of people still subscribing to dial-up internet because yeah. they do not have access to cable or fiber or gigabit or anything. So that's how they get online. It's not like for us, the internet is life. And for them, the internet is there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, and then when the pandemic hit and the lockdown happened, everybody was stuck at home. And a lot of these people that were stuck at home didn't realize, well, wait a minute, my streaming really sucks because my internet's so slow. So they went out right. and, and bought bought it physical media. And well, do you do you know what constituted ninety five percent of box office sales in twenty twenty one during the pandemic? Was physical media right? Drive in movies. Oh, drive in. Oh, you said cinema. Yeah, drive in movies. Yeah, drive in movies accounted for ninety five percent of box office sales in twenty twenty one because no one went to a theater. Yeah, yeah, you're safe in your car. Um, And now I'm starting to see these articles. Uh, Variety put one out. Um, Hollywood Reporter put one out. And a couple of places put one out about why physical media is so important. 
uh, Variety put one out and said, why did I spend $450 on a 4K player in 2023? And today, CNN brought this one out. Um, Thanks to the limits of modern home internet, 4K Blu-rays will always look better as the data is local. You're not streaming a compressed version, which can be good enough when it, when it's only your option. So a lot of people are starting to see the true benefits of physical media. And us physical media collectors and, and lovers are being vindicated now. <laughs> because... Yeah, I mean, is, it, is it so... Is it so out of the, the the ordinary for someone to want to own or just hold what they want to watch or listen to? I mean, you know, people make fun of of hipsters for loving vinyl, but the fact is, people want to they want to hold what they're listening to. They want something tangible. Um, it's 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 a tactile experience. I mean, my dad used to tell me about how he'd you know he he runs to the the, the local shop to buy Sergeant Pepper and he lay he lay on his bed like staring at the album art. No one's gonna sit there staring at their phone. <laughs> yeah, you know, to really. look at the album art. It's it's really. it's an experience, and I think movies are a lot of that. And we see that with stuff like Criterion and and Arrow and and Kino Lorber. You know, they do these sets where it's not just a movie, but it's a booklet, it's essays, it's it's the script of the film, it's it's this whole thing. You know, that used to be a one off, and now it's sort of de rigueur for a lot of these companies because it, it provides a, a whole three hundred and sixty experience. Yeah, and it's like uh, like we talked about before these boutique companies like Arrow Video. I had hit this here on laying on my desk, you know, for for RoboCop. This is the 4K, and it comes with this booklet, and it's kind of like what you were saying that <laughs> that you were well, your dad was laying on his bed reading the the liner notes while listening right. to through the album. To and remember. you know, when you've seen this movie a gazillion times, you're reading the book while watching the movie while the movie's on, and it's a, it's just a really right. cool companion piece. Um, and also, physical media gives us access to things that digital often doesn't, like director's commentaries or special features, deleted scenes, bloopers, um, you know, the stuff of, of of making the film. That's what breeds filmmakers. Jaws is a terrific movie, but what got me interested in it was the hour and a half documentary of uh, The Shark is Not Working, where I got to learn about the making of the film. That's what made me love the film even more. Yeah, exactly. Um, or it's like, you know, Avatar. We, we know Avatar is on Disney+. Plus, But then they release right. these these box sets. And it's like, look right. at how cool that artwork is. And, you know, you don't... It's got it's a magnet, so it's it, it holds together with a small magnet inside. You know, you got all this, the discs, the artwork. I mean, yep. you don't get any of that with... with um, streaming of course um yeah. and then like for instance like you said there are movies that you can't find on streaming like old boy i don't think you can find that anywhere on streaming but guess who put out the 4k neon right. put out a 4k it was just on netflix recently for a while i don't know if it's still there but it was it was on netflix for a time but and like, goes, like i said like trying to figure out who's got what is damn near impossible yeah and and all the rights you know are up in the air because you know they license them out for a period of time when that contract's up. If they don't want to renew the contract or the the place, the studio where they're licensing from doesn't, if they don't come to an agreement on the licensing, then it's gone. And that includes with stuff that you even buy on streaming. I've been saying this for years and no one really believed me until recently when all these articles started coming out saying you don't really own what you buy on streaming. Right. Um, one thing I wanted to, yeah, exactly. You lease it. Now, one thing I wanted to get into is with True Lies. Now, this is something that's it, it, become quite a controversy, and that is with True Lies, what people are saying is being scrubbed and DNR to death where everything looks waxy or cartoony, things like that. Now, mm -hmm. what people don't, people tend to think that, first of all, DNR is digital noise reduction. Basically, you're going in there and kind of smoothing out the heavy noise and grain in the background. And some of it can be generational loss from the negative, where it just has that extra rough look to it. And, you know, they don't, it, it doesn't look good. Um, also, some directors, if directors had it their way, they wouldn't have any grain in their films, first of all. Um, because a lot of directors don't like the look of grain because you lose all the rich detail because a lot of times if it's heavy grain engulfs the detail. Right. Um, so sometimes movies need to be 
what people say scrubbed. Um, it's really called grain management. Now with True Lies, there's a lot of people are saying that when the uh, streaming came out, like I said, it was DNR to death. James Cameron loves DNR and everything looks all waxy and, and stuff like this. Now, I have a friend who worked on the restoration of the Abyss and True Lies. And I talked to him about this um, when, all of, when all this came out uh, um, a few weeks ago. And I just want to read what he wrote back. And this is really important here for True Lies. He says, on True Lies, the problem we ran into while working on the original negative, there are some out of focus shots and soft shots. And we had a decision to make. Clean up the image with some grain management and push the sharpening further which, yes, would make those shots look a bit processed or do nothing. And those shots would look significantly worse in their the higher resolution. James, who is James Cameron, had to make the decision. We actually put up a comparison for Jim, and he decided to go with the lesser of two evils, knowing the shots would end out looking overly processed, but it literally looked much, much worse without it. So yes, shots do look a little overly processed for a good, for a very good reason and specific reason that your average viewer just wouldn't understand or appreciate. And to me, that sums it up right there. Yeah, there have been some instances where releases were just washed over with grain management where everything does look soft and depletes it of depth and makes things look waxy. Terminator mm -hmm. 2 is a perfect example. Uh, in Glorious Bastards, the 4K is now a good example. But then there are other movies like True Lies where this has to be done. Otherwise, it, it would not look good with the higher resolution because it's it would look it, it, it had soft focus and out of focus shots. So right. sharpening and doing some grain management helped to bring the details and uh, the movie to look more how James Cameron wanted it to look. And what I find interesting is that they actually gave James Cameron a choice here. Do you want it to look like this or do you want it to look like that? Which one looks the best? And like he said, he chose the lesser of two evils. But he also said he knew that people wouldn't understand or appreciate the reasons why. And this is why I always say, again, if you follow me long enough, you, you always hear me say this. When people go in to review movies, uh, 4Ks, they have this knee-jerk reaction to just beat it over the head and say, this 4K sucks. It's the worst, you know, transfer I've seen. Well, take a step back and find out the reasons why it looks like that. Don't just think it's a bad transfer and they don't know what they're doing. There's re Sometimes, like with True Lies, there's reasons why they had to make this choice. And a lot of times, if you find out the reasons why they made the choice, then you can understand and... It's, you know, yeah, I would rather have it this way than have it look almost unwatchable because you don't know how it looked the other way. It, it was pro If James Cameron said, no, I want it this way, then the other way was probably really bad. Yeah. Um, this, is, this is the problem with our ever-increasing desire for higher resolutions because when these movies were made, they were shot on 35 millimeter film, um, you know, they were, the dailies were viewed through these tiny monitors, um, you know, that were not high resolution, nothing was high resolution. And so you could get away with, you know, oh, well, the makeup on that, that hair piece or the, the, the seam on the ha that hair piece won't get picked up by the, the camera. No one's going to notice it. Well, they'll notice it in 30 years when we try to, you know, to, to restore it and we can see the line where the, the, the wig right. meets the scalp. Um, so the other thing is, you know, when we when we last saw these films, we either saw them in the theater, mm -hmm. which is dark, and it was run through a projector. So it was, you know, you, the, there's an old joke: you spend half your time in movie theater in the dark because you're you're seeing every other frame basically. Um, and so it was either that, or you saw it on like a, an old CRT television on TNT, you know, on cable. And so that also wasn't high resolution. So now we're seeing them brighter than they've ever been, higher resolution than they've ever been. And so now we get to see every single flaw. Like if you used to, if you paused a VHS, you'd get a blurry image. If you pause a, a 4K DVD now, you stop it and you can take a screenshot and put that up. Ah. And it's perfect every single mm -hmm. time. And that's part of the problem. We can see every single 
flaw and detail and pockmark and everything. And so when they do these terrible 4K restorations, I mean, they're terrible comparatively, you know, they look terrible to us because we expect better because we're seeing stuff shot digitally that looks better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think especially modern audiences that didn't grow up with, you know, v VHS, didn't grow up with, um, you know, uh, 35 millimeter, 60 millimeter scene in the theater. They, they grew right. up with digital. So they're used to how one a movie looks a certain way. And then when they see a movie like True Lies, they're like, what the heck? This looks like garbage. What's going on here? This is a bad transfer. Yeah. And, um, you know, um, and a lot of times, I mean, you're absolutely right. Because back in, in the day, you know, we had CRT, CRT TVs, which is the reason why a lot of studios would go in and they would manipulate the color, manipulate the look and the appearance of a movie so that it would work better on a CRT TV. And they changed it. Now with 4K, they bring in the director or the DP, the director of photography, to help them, to guide them along of how the movie should look color-wise bringing it back to as close as possible to theatrical presentation. So if you've spent your whole life watching this movie, particular movie on TV, on, v uh, on VHS, DVD, Laserdisc, whatever it is, even Blu-ray, and then when the 4K comes out and it's a different color grading, everybody's immediate reaction is, not everybody, but you know, majority of people, immediate reaction is, well, this is wrong or they effed up the transfer, they effed up the color grading. Why did they do this? When in actuality, what you were used to was wrong and the 4K is right. right. And and so I, that's Even a big problem. Oh, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, sorry. Well, I don't know if you saw my latest comparison of Conan the Barbarian 4K versus, versus Blu-ray, but that, mm -hmm is one that I got some comments on saying that they effed up the transfer and the colors because that's not the way it looks. And I, and I would ask, well, how did you watch it? Well, I, I always watched it on DVD. I'm like, well, there's your problem right there. <laughs> that's right. the problem. The, Steven at OTS Movies talks about this with um, the 1978 Halloween because he saw it. He saw a 35 millimeter print in theaters and there's a, mm -hmm. I can't remember which edition it is, but there is a, a 4K edition that was put out that is, color corrected to the way it was shown in theaters and it is different from the other version the other transfer they had um that people seem to gravitate towards but it's wrong it's it's the yeah. way you would see it on tv or on, on dvd um it's yeah 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 i mean and, and so it's kind of like you know when you see a 4k and like i just like i said you know i hate repeating myself one over again but i, I feel it's important when you get a 4K and you look at it and you think, well, this doesn't look like how I remember it looking, take a step back and find out why it looks that way. And that's one reason why I do these intros with my comparison videos is because I do my research and I try to find out why did this movie look a certain way than it did in the past and try to help explain the reasons why it does. Um, Titanic is another one that I got a huge, huge flack on because everyone was saying that it's wrong and james cameron screwed it up when you know it obviously wasn't wrong why would why would james cameron want to screw up his own movie <laughs> first of all i mean you know um but uh let's digress here and let's um i mean let's let's talk about uh the oscar nominations now sure let's dive into that um and there we go i got some screenshots here um, first of all, I think it's interesting that the Oscars is being cat telecast an hour earlier than normal. I don't know what the reason behind that is. Um, I just thought that was interesting, but I thought that we would go through some of these categories, some of the top categories and, and give our thoughts on them. And for some reason, my thing here didn't put them in order. So I'm just going to go through them. Um, I'm going to put the chat up here on the screen overlaid. So if anybody has any questions or comments, okay. it will show up there. I'm on um, the CBS website. I've got the, the list up here. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. So let's see here. Like I said, this isn't in order. It, uh, for some reason, they put it in order. So I'm just going to bring up, bring them up here. So the first one is, so for film editing. Um, now I'm sure like you, 
I mean, like me, you haven't seen every movie that's being nominated. Um, no. However, I did see every movie nominated for editing. Um, I just recently saw Anatomy in a Fall, which was outstanding, excellent. So we have nominees for film editing, Anatomy of a Fall, The Holdovers, Killers of the Flower Moon, Oppenheimer, and Poor Things. Um, so what, uh, which one of those movies have you seen and which ones would you pick? So the, the only one, unfortunately, I spend so much time in classic film land, and I don't get to theaters. So I um, I just got over COVID, and we don't go anywhere. So it, I, it's really frustrating. So I saw The Holdovers when it finally hit streaming. Um, I plan on seeing Killers of the Flower Moon this weekend because it's on Apple TV+. Plus. Um, and I've seen pieces of Oppenheimer. I haven't seen the whole thing. Um, but, I mean, just because of what they were trying to achieve, and it's the only one I've seen. The holdovers, I mean, was just I love. I still think about that movie. That's how I, I know it was good is because I still think about that world and and those characters. Yeah. Um, so I mean, for me, you know, what they were trying to go for, they nailed it. They they knocked it out of the park. Yeah, and the one thing about editing, I've actually had some people say this to me: Why do they give an award for editing? All you do is cut and put scenes together. It's so much more than that. And oh, when God. you. S- yeah, way more than that. I you know, I worked in the film industry for about 15 years, and I've always heard every producer, director, filmmaker say, the movie is not made while you're shooting it. The movie is made in editing. That's where the movie's made. And I've done this myself, where I'll shoot a film and say I shot a scene of dialogue on this particular date, but I shot the scene on this particular date. And I've taken dialogue that from this date over here and put it into the scene that I'm editing that was shot on that date because that scene of dialogue worked better for that scene. Right. And it flowed better. And, I mean, if you want to see how powerful editing is, Star Wars, I mean, George Lucas even admits that if it wasn't for his wife editing the film, and George, I mean, not George Lucas, uh, uh, John Williams' score, the movie was a complete disaster. And um, so there's way more. I'm not going to get all into it because it'll take a long time, but there's way more to editing than, than what people realize. Oh, I, I, I think a part of the problem today is that people see editing. People, people can edit on their phones. We can edit on our computers. We edit the same way on our devices that professional Hollywood people do on their devices. It's the same programs. It's all been yeah. democratized now. And so, and also nonlinear editing on a computer is so low stakes, you know, sure your hard drive can get corrupted or, or whatever, but you know, when Verna Fields is sitting in a, a, a shack with the entire reels from <laughs> Jaws and she's stitching that together, there, there are legitimate high stakes if she makes a wrong cut and leaves oh. something on the cutting room floor. You know, yeah. it the editor is almost just as responsible for how a film comes out as the director is, if not more so. Um, they are just as much storytellers, and they're making decisions, you know, to to help the director bring a film to fruition. Um, so yeah, to to say that editing is no big deal, it just completely ignores the the art form that it is. Yeah, yeah, and Miss Worf says perfectly, good editing is a true art form, hundred percent. It absolutely is. Um, out of now, I've seen all of them. Um, all the films nominated, and I th- I would choose Oppenheimer or Holdovers. Oppenheimer has some incredible editing, and it was shot on film. Um, Holdovers, I believe, was not shot on film. I thought it was it was shot digitally, but then it was made to look like the 1970s mm-hmm. period. Is that accurate? I'm not entirely sure. I want to say yes because I think they were working on a smaller budget, so it was. I think they shot digitally just because it was cheaper. Um, so yeah. yeah, it's sort of like, um, a brother where art that was the first, the first film to be digitally color altered, yeah. um, narrow, narrowly beating out chicken run. Um, <laughs> but that, that sepia tone was not done. It wasn't done on film. That was all run through a computer. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, the holdovers was shot digitally and then edited or, you know, colorized and everything later, which is outstanding when you think about it, that they shot it digitally and the way it looks, it looks like a 1970s film. It looks it like does. a period piece, 100%. That's that's part of the reason I loved it so much is it was so 
like it knew what it wanted to be and it it just nailed it yeah 100 percent. alexander payne he knows what he's doing <laughs> no doubt about oh, that absolutely um let's come on i have here is nominees for uh supporting actress or yeah actress and supporting role enemy blunt oppenheimer daniel brooks in the color purple america ferraria in barbie jody foster in naiad and davine joy randolph in the holdovers um i'm guessing again did you see barbie I did. I saw Barbie. I liked Barbie a lot. I thought it was fantastic. I think America Ferrera is great, but she's always America Ferrera. Like America Ferrera in Superstore was America Ferrera in Barbie. And yes, she's very talented, but I was it an Oscar worthy performance? I wasn't convinced. Um, so Divine Joy Randolph, like Miss Wave says here, like she was she was phenomenal and she came out of nowhere. Like I, I hadn't really heard of her before and she just came out, you know, like a bat out of hell. She just carried that movie with paul yeah Giamatti. i mean when i heard that that america ferrari was was nominated i was like what <laughs> it didn't make sense to me why she was nominated especially since margot robbie wasn't which we'll get into soon um next up we have here is nominees for best picture so we have american fiction which i haven't seen and i'm dying to see i want to uh, see that really badly yeah anatomy of a fall barbie the holdovers killers of flower moon maestro uh, Oppenheimer, Past Lives, Poor Things, The Zone of Interest. Zone of Interest, I haven't even heard of. I have no idea what that's about. Um, I've heard of it, but a lot of these I haven't seen. Um, Maestro I saw. And I I do not hate Maestro the way a lot of people on TikTok seem to hate Maestro. Let me ask you this it question. Is, okay. Why do you think there's so much hate for Maestro? I think, and, and rightly, I think it was Oscar bait. I think this was a... Like Bradley Cooper was a grad student trying to set, make a movie with a message, and this was what he made. And technically speaking, I think he did, and I think it was fantastic from a technical perspective. If you watch him conduct, it's like watching Leonard Bernstein. He is phenomenal in that role. Um, you know, ignore the makeup, ignore the the nose. It is so difficult to portray a musician or a composer or a conductor accurately if you are not part of that world if you've never done that before and the, i i was watching behind the scenes of of him studying with another conductor and just getting the movements down and he is he like embodies bernstein he's so fantastic my I issue with spent, the film oh go ahead oh i was gonna say i think he said he spent like five years training mm -hmm. to to compose and 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 get the mannerisms and voice right of of uh, yeah. bernstein it, it wasn't just an impression like he was Leonard Bernstein and he was terrific in it. And I, I love the performance. This, if this had just been a, uh, an Oscar bait film that would have shown in his performance, he would have, you know, he would have been Bradley Cooper in Maestro, but he wasn't, he like disappeared into the role. And I think he deserves to be on that list with everyone else. Um, yeah. I actually don't think um, Gosling deserves to be on there. It was, Ryan Gosling, like he was good, he was great, but I I think Margot Robbie deserved it more. I think Rhea Perlman deserved a, a an Oscar nod for her performance in Barbie more than Ryan Gosling did. Um, yeah, yeah. But but to me, Maestro was my issue with Maestro is that just like there was a the a nineteen eighties um, biopic of Charlie Park that Clint Eastwood did, where he focused almost entirely on the drug use. Where was the music? That's what I wanted. I wanted to see. Bernstein composing West Side Story. I wanted to see him working with kids in the um, the the youth symphony stuff that he used to do, the the youth orchestra TV show that he used to do. Um, so do you, you know, think I, I wanted to I, I wanted to see more of like the the musicality of everything and not just a soap opera. Do you think that might have been one of the problems with it? Is that people wanted to see more of a biography, and they instead they got this relationship between him and his wife. Yeah, I, I think there there are two kinds of biopics you could get. You can either get the full blown beginning to end, you know, this is the life of the person, like they did with um, Ashton Kutcher and Steve Jobs. Um, they did, um, you know, got so many biopics they've done where it's like the beginning to end. Um, or you can get like a a snippet of their life. And so going back to the Jobs reference, the Michael Fassbender movie they did, the Jobs movie, where it was like three Aaron Sorkin wrote it it was three vignettes set at three specific times in his career it was like 
the the introduction of the Macintosh, the introduction of the iPod, and the introduction of the iPhone, I think, were the, the three big ones. Or maybe it was the iMac and the iPod or something. Yeah. But then, like, what was going on backstage and his, his issues with his daughter and, you know, all, how all of that was leading up to him unveiling these products on stage. Like, I really love those kinds of things because that, that went in with a very specific idea of we're not going to look at jobs from the garage in Palo Alto all the way up to him getting kicked out of Apple and you know, starting Pixar and next and all that, we're, yeah. we're going to show who this man was in three distinct parts, points of his life. And I think that's fine. Um, clearly Maestro was supposed to be like a, a happy medium between the two. Cause it starts young, you know, youngish when he's in his like twenties and it goes all the way up to when he's in his old age and that relationship with his wife. But like, that's not what I wanted to see. I didn't want to yeah. see a soap opera. I wanted to see, Leonard Bernstein, the composer. Now, see, Steven Spielberg was originally set to direct an open, I mean, Oppenheimer, uh, direct a um, Bernstein uh, biopic, and yeah. that's was his original script was his a life of Leonard Bernstein and not just this part of his life. Um, and I think that, uh, going back to Steven Spielberg, I think that's also what happened of Lincoln. Why a lot of people didn't like it because they went in wanting to see the story of Abraham Lincoln and not just about the, um, you know, wh what he did to free the slaves. Um, but yeah, I, I'm seeing a but lot that, of hate. That's where the action is. Like the, the action is the negotiation of the, the end of the war and, and, you know, freeing the slaves and, and, you know, releasing the country from this horror that was slavery. Like that's where the, the conflict and the drama are. If you want to go see, lincoln's life go watch young mr lincoln go watch yeah. you know any of the number of biopics go watch abraham lincoln vampire hunter that's also fantastic <laughs> <laughs> like that go go watch any one of those but if you want to see what the man really was like or, or what he did and watch a terrific performance from from daniel day lewis in the process lincoln is, a, is an amazing oh, film yeah 100 percent. now tidbit tid, tidbit kid made an interesting point he said that oscars are very political so it's probably gonna be killers of flower moon I honestly don't agree with that. I don't think Killers of Flower Moon is going to get it. Um, I think Oppenheimer is going to take it. That is everyone's. Everyone says Oppenheimer is locked in to take it. I uh, I agree. Um, my show is not going to get it. Barbie's not going to get it. Um, I think it's going to be between American Fiction, Oppenheimer, and uh, and holdovers. Probably four things is is probably up there too. Um, that yeah. seems to be getting a lot of buzz, and I think that's where a lot of the, a lot of these, wins come from. Is what what has the buzz, and who's greasing whose palms, and well, that's know. the thing too. Is you know, how much money is a studio paying to get this film nominated? <laughs> you know, right. <laughs> um, but yeah, the the I think it's those four that that are going to be butting heads: is American Fiction, Oppenheimer, um, uh, Holdovers, and Poor Things. Um, uh, but if I was to say who's going to win for sure, I mean, I can't, I don't know. Um, I'm assuming Oppenheimer is going to win, but you know, I've been surprised before in the past. Um, let me skip through a couple of these, uh, actor. Okay. Going to what you were talking about with Bradley Cooper. We have actor in leading role, Bradley Cooper, Maestro, uh, Coleman Domingo and Rustin, which I have not seen. Paul Giamatti in a holdovers, uh, Kelly and Murphy in Oppenheimer and Jeffrey Wright in American fiction. Now, everybody's praising uh, Jeffrey Wright, saying it's his best mm -hmm. role of his career. Yeah. Uh, G Giamatti took it home at the Golden Globes. I have a feeling he's probably near the top for um, for taking the home the win this time, too. Now, do you know who won uh, SAG? I don't. I don't either. If anybody I don't knows who... a lot of award shows. I I hate award shows for the most <laughs> yeah. part. The Tonys are the only ones I really watch and because those – those are fun and there's music and singing and dancing and I have like no interest in any of these. Yeah. The Oscars is the only one that I ever watch. It's I've been watching since I was a kid. And it's kind of just like, I, it's one of those is like, I always have to watch it every year. Um, it, the Oscars took a bad taste in my mouth when um, I found out, well, a, when that thing you do, the song did not win the Oscar for best song. I was pissed off. And then, <laughs> I when I learned that the Oscars were had originally started as a union busting tactic, I was mm -hmm. like, I'm done. I don't care how far we've come and how things have changed. It's still a bunch of rich people patting each other on the back. And I just I have no interest. 
Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I look at it as just as, you know, um, celebrating the art form. That's how I look at it. Um, I think it's going to be either Killian Murphy or Jeffrey Wright or Paul Giamatti. Those are the three that are going to be uh, – they're, they're going to go head-to-head. Um, I For some reason, it, it, to me, it always comes back to, like – what what has had the most buzz and is like American fiction is getting a lot of buzz right now, but I feel like it hasn't been building up for a long enough amount of time. And so as much as I would love to see, I want to see Paul Giamatti take it home, but I would love to see yeah. Jeffrey Wright take it home. But I think it has, he hasn't been like on the buzz circuit long enough that it's probably going to end up going to, to Killian Murphy. I think Oppenheimer is going to sweep this year, which, you know, I mean, good for Nolan, but I'm, I'm just tired of watching him blow things up. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, let's see, actor in a supporting role. Now, I 100% believe that Robert Downey Jr. is going to win. I think he's a lock to win. Um, his, his performance in Oppenheimer was was outstanding. I mean, he like what you were saying with Bradley Cooper, where he lost himself in that role. The same thing with Robert Downey Jr. He lost himself in that role. I mean, when I first saw it in the theater, I didn't. It didn't click that that was actually him until af, until a little while later um, during the film. So I think that he's he's going to win, take that Oscar home. Um, Ryan Gosling, I, no. Um, I I they could have replaced Ryan Gosling with Dominic Sessa from The Holdovers, and it would have worked a lot better. I think he deserves it more than Ryan Gosling does. Oh yeah. Yeah, I that is the biggest disagreement I have with Oscar nominations is Ryan Goslin, mainly because they also didn't nominate Margot Robbie and Greta Gerwig. Yeah. And and what I love love is that Ryan Goslin put out a statement here. And I'm gonna read it real quick here. And it says there is no Ken without Barbie, and there is no Barbie movie without Greta Gerwig and Margot Robbie, the two people most responsible for this history making globally celebrated film. And he says um, uh, that no recog- down on the bottom here it says no recognition would be possible for anyone on the film without their talent, grit, and genius, Goslin said. And I love that he made this uh, let me get out of here. I love that he made this statement because it's number one shows how, the humility he has. He understands that I don't think he appreciates that he was nominated when the other two weren't. Yeah, you can tell he feels that's not right. That's not legit. That's well, how ironic that the guy who's the guy gets a nomination for playing a character whose entire mo in the movie <laughs> is to build a world where men are recognized over women for not doing much and yeah he gets the nomination over margot robbie and greta <laughs> and you know greta gerwig doesn't get her her nomination right. either like it just it's mind-blowing that they snubbed the two most important and deserving people to give it to to, to others who i like again america ferrara great actress i don't think she did an oscar-worthy performance here yeah and it's like Barbie, the movie, wouldn't exist, number one, without Margot Robbie. She's the one that spearheaded the entire thing. She is the one that asked Greta Gerwig to come and direct this film. The studio didn't want her to direct the film. They wanted someone else. And she championed Greta Gerwig to write and direct this film. And, I mean, do I think that it would win Best Picture? Do I think Margot Robbie would win Best Actress? Probably not. I don't think it would have. But still... They probably wouldn't have won, but I, honestly, Ger- Gerwig deserves to be up there more than anyone. Just you know, she's, 100%. she's so good at what she does. And look, you've got a you've got a best picture list that's like a dozen films deep. There's no reason you couldn't have thrown one or two more people on the list for best actor, best actress, um, best director. Like, why why not? Yeah, yeah. That's that was my biggest complaint of of uh of uh, of the oscars which everyone else is talking about too that they got they got snubbed it it, it, that, it just wasn't right and i'm really glad that ryan goslin quickly put out that statement um miss wharf says it margot robbie was fantastic she should have been nominated 100 percent. i mean without mm-hmm. her like ryan goslin said without her there'd be no barbie without greta gerwig there'd be no movie simple and, as that and the two of them i, I don't think it is it is not understood, but I don't think it's just admired enough that 
the Barbie movie could have been a very silly kids film. Oh, very 100%. easily. 100%. And Greta Gerwig and Margot Robbie turned that into a much more poignant adult picture than it had any right to be. Um, and they just, they, they really blew it out of the water. And, and it the had... fact that it was, that, that they were snubbed like that is just egregious. And the movie had a message to it. It wasn't just some dumb kids movie. It had a message to it. It had a, re- a point to it. it. It was it was like it was like when the Force Awakens came out and a bunch of girls were were like, "Oh my god, I finally feel represented in, you know, a, a cult a fandom that is has always catered to boys." Um, yeah. or when the Marvel uh, when Captain Marvel came out and girls would show up at the premiere dressed as Captain Marvel. Like it's it's one of those pictures that sort of brings a generation and brings a, a group together the the way other films can and it's just it's it's gross the way they handled it this year yeah yeah that was just yeah um next up we have nominees for best director anatomy of a fall kills the flower moon oppenheimer poor things the zone of interest see they could have easily put greta gerwig in there um uh, no excuse why they couldn't why they couldn't have i mean i've never i haven't seen zone of interest but if you can only have that many i would boot him out and bring in greta gerwig um, but all just I've add seen Greta Gerwig. Like, why why do we have a list of best pictures that's like eight or nine films, and there's five of each of the other nominees? Like, just add Gerwig. What right. does it matter? Yeah, exactly. Now I've seen these all except for Zone of Interest, um, and they're all beautifully directed. I mean, I don't have a problem yeah. with any of these uh, direct nominee nominee nominations. Um, I mean, Martin Scorsese just knocked his uh kills the flat moon out of the park um and so did uh, anatomy of fall i don't know if you've seen that it's it's on vod now but it's it's that's also beautifully shot um and directed um if i was to choose if it was me and i was choosing i would probably do martin scorsese for kills of flower moon um number yeah, one I mean, they- it's always a safe bet with Scorsese. I, I like Christopher Nolan. Do not get me wrong. I enjoyed the Batman films. I enjoyed. Um, I never saw Tenet. I honestly don't feel like I'm missing much. Um, but I, I like Nolan. I, I like his his aesthetic. Um, but I also feel like Nolan keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Like I want to see someone take away his budget and make him do like a remake of of My Dinner with Andre. Just do well, a normal film. <laughs> like what I've like I, what I've been saying I've been saying this for a long time now. I wish like you I 100 percent agree with you. His budgets keep going up and up and up. The movies get bigger and bigger and bigger, which is fine. But there comes a point where you have to take a step back and go back to your roots. You know he did in, uh, the remake to Insomnia, low budget movie. Mm. He did uh, Memento, low lower budget movie. Yep. I I there want the, to. Uh, didn't he do Following? Wasn't that his first film? That, that yeah. Neo Noir. Yeah. yeah, it was a, yeah, and it's like I would love to see Nolan go back to making a smaller film. Um, and I think sometimes when directors get this big, I mean, yeah, his movies are extremely well made, beautifully shot. They have a message to them, all that stuff. But I just feel that he's that when you get that big and have an unlimited budget, you start using that as a crutch instead right. of using your own imagination and um creativity you start losing the creativity um of, of what I'm you would give comments i have things to say <laughs> what, what was that i'm reading the comments and i have things to say oh <laughs> i i disagree vehemently with um the it was a commercial well i mean it was a commercial film like the lego movie but the lego movie was also terrific it wasn't just here buy legos it was there was a message behind it and it, it fit the theme of the toy well, which was build, build, use your imagination, be original, be unique. You know, don't just adhere to the directions we put in the box. Um, and then think, what, 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 at the end of that movie, War Ferrell learns that it's okay. It doesn't matter what age you are. You can still be a kid. Right. Right. Exactly. And, and, you know, he, well, I like, he calls it like a, a, a modular building, or a modular construction set, you know, because he's an adult using it, and it's it's not a toy. Yeah, um, you know, it's like but saying like the Oscars. 
Okay. It's like saying I have action figures, not toys. <laughs> exactly. They're they're collectibles, damn it. Um, <laughs> Oscars are not usually favorable to directors or actors that are in the last leg of their filmography. Hard disagree. Scorsese was snubbed for the for most of his career. He 100%. won his first Oscar with The Departed. Sorry, The Departed. And honestly, not as good of a film as most of the other ones that came before. He should have won for Goodfellas. He should have won for Taxi Driver. Um, but he won for for The Departed. And it's still a good film, but like in in the, his whole oeuvre, like it was okay. Um, you know, I, was, I think he was nominated for Irishman too. I mean, mm-hmm. it's not his best work, I don't think, but still, he was nominated. And uh, he, he's one of those directors where almost every movie he brings out, he's nominated for best director. Yeah, um, he's not a. You're, you're never going to get a bad movie out of him, just like you're never going to yeah. get a bad movie out of Tarantino or Spielberg. Or Spielberg even yeah. even 1941, which is not a great movie <laughs> still has its moments and is yeah. is an admirable um achievement for a director who'd never done a comedy before um john uh, so john pemble saying you know john williams is nominated for the indie music honestly the music in that movie was the best part of it and if if like john williams is pushing 100 give him the fucking oscar he's got enough right. anyway just just l- let him round out his collection he's <laughs> i think he's using them as a chess set at this point <laughs> and uh, yeah i mean I agree. I mean, uh, the music was the best part of that movie. That movie was just uh, uh, garbage to me. I actually enjoyed it. I love the, any Indiana Jones movie. Just like John Wick movies, you can make 40 of them. I don't care how many. If if uh, Harrison Ford's putting on the hat and the whip, I'm going to watch it. I don't care. I'm going to watch it, but it doesn't mean I like it. <laughs> like, I, um, I I love the, I, the, the theme comes up, and he's, he's sl- slinging the whip, and he's punching Nazis. It's like, yeah, yeah. I'm here for this. Yeah, I, I know yeah. it's bad. I don't care. I, I, yeah. I enjoy it anyway. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I will admit it was better than Crystal Skull. I, I, I enjoyed it more than Crystal Skull. Um, I watched Crystal Skull again. The only, the two things I didn't like about Crystal Skull was the Soviets. I, I missed. I, I can't believe I'm saying that. I missed the Nazis. I, I that, that's his villain. His villains always the Nazis. Don't take that away. And then the, the swinging with the monkeys through the jungle with Shia, Shia the Beef. I hated that. Like that. Even the the fridge, the lead fridge, was a better sequence than him swinging with the monkeys. Like I've always said, the first half of Crystal Skull is fine. I like it. I enjoy it. It felt like an Ian Jones movie. The middle oh, that section whole chase sequence through the warehouse with the Ark of the Covenant falling out that was awesome. And the uh, the chase uh, on the uh, campus, the college campus, was great too. Yes, real fun. Yeah, and the that inter- chase sequence it- on the campus. And inside the cafe, when uh, Indiana Jones is talking to Mutt, and the whole choreography there during, you know, like he takes a drink, and then he takes someone, Mutt takes someone's drink, and then Harrison Ford takes a drink back and puts it back on the person's uh, table. I mean, that whole well, choreography yeah. is great. Yeah. And then you get to the middle of the movie, and it's actually, like, eh, it's okay. But then you get to more towards on the third act, like what you were saying, with swinging with the monkeys. Uh, when he throws the python at Ian Jones when he's sinking in oh, the quicksand. Call it a rope. Call it yeah. a rope. <laughs> and I'm just like, what are that you doing? Silly, yeah. <laughs> but like the, the jungle the jungle vehicle sequence with the, the, the cars that were cutting down, the trucks that were cutting down the trees as they went, and they're, you yeah. said the bazooka and all that. That was awesome. That was like the, the, the chase sequence in Last Crusade with the tank and everything. Um, yeah. That was great. So like John Williams score is fantastic. He he doesn't Oops. like Scorsese doesn't make a bad film. John Williams doesn't make a bad score. Uh, yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, you can have the worst movie I mean, going back to Star Wars. Without John Williams score, yeah, that movie would not nearly be as great. Um, let's move into actress in the leading role, Annette Benning in Nyad. Now have you seen Nyad? I haven't, no. Okay, it's a Netflix. I think it was in limited release, and then and now it's on Netflix. I started watching it. It's pretty good. Uh, yeah, Lily uh, Glad. Netflix owns the Chinese. Is it the Chinese theater or the Egyptian theater? I think it's the Egyptian, Egyptian theater. theater yeah. Egyptian um, theater. So they can show they can show limited release movies and get that Oscar nom. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Lily Gladstone, which I think is a lock. I think she's going to. I win. think she's got that. I, I I think if she doesn't get it, people are going to freak. Yeah, Sandra Holler, Name of Fall, Carrie Mulligan, Maestro, Maestro, Emma Stone, Poor Things. Uh, yeah, I, I, it's 100% going to be Lily Gladstone. I, I personally yeah. think that's probably going to be maybe one out of maybe two or three Oscars, Kill the Flower Moon will win. I don't think it's going to win that much, but I it's, think that's going to be a I, I don't think so either. I don't think he's going to win Best Director. Um, no. 
or best, best picture deserves it but but yeah, he's not gonna win best picture um it's a good it's i from what i've seen of it it looks fantastic i i haven't i've seen clips of it i haven't seen the whole thing i'm, I'm hoping to watch it this weekend i think i said that earlier um but yeah i i think she's the the highlight of it and i think she's gonna take that home um and uh, i think I people heard... are gonna revolt if she doesn't oh yeah i mean she needs to um yeah, as Miss Wave says, Lily gave such a beautiful performance. It's it's a heart wrenching performance too. I mean, you really feel for her. Um, but Carrie Mulligan also gave a terrific performance. Um, yeah. In Maestro, I mean, she was she honestly might have been, you know, the highlight of the film, um, even beyond Bradley Cooper. Um, but again, I I think Lily is a lock for this. Like you yeah. said. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to adapted screenplay. Um, American fiction, Barbie, Oppenheimer, poor things, uh, zone of interest. Now, would you consider Barbie an adapted screenplay? Because I thought that Greta Gerwig and Noah Bonk, uh, Baumbach, B- Baumbach uh, wouldn't that be considered – because they wrote that from scratch. So they're, be- they're claiming that because Barbie is previously existing IP, it is an adapted screenplay. I don't agree with that. I, think it I don't either. Original. It's not like they – they adapted one of those old '90s Barbie made-for-TV movies into a live action. Like this is this is a, a an original screenplay. The character existed, but you're telling me if you know is Winnie the Pooh Blood and Honey an adapted screenplay? No. <laughs> um, you know, I, I just because the characters exist, the screenplay is an original creation, and I think should be treated as such. I I a hundred percent agree with that because it just it does. It doesn't make sense to me because when I think adapted screenplay, I'm thinking, okay, it's from a book or from a pre-existing right. screenplay, not from a pre-existing IP. I mean, does that mean that Jurassic Park is an adapted screenplay because dinosaurs used to roam the earth? I mean, yeah, it doesn't make sense if, to me. If they if they had done <laughs> Hedda Gabler with Margot Robbie playing Barbie in the lead <laughs> role, then sure, yeah, it'd make it an adapted screenplay. But yeah. I, I don't think like, you know, Romeo and Juliet adapted screenplay, the Boz Lerman, you know, that's clear and clear and cut and dry. But this yeah. no existing IP should not just automatically categorize something uh, as adapted. I 100 100 percent agree with that. Now, what I can see happening is because of the huge backlash with Greta Gerwig not to be nominated for director and Margot Robbie not being nominated and that you have Ryan Goslin coming in campaigning. Why weren't they nominated? I right. think that they may actually win for best screenplay because or adapted screenplay because of that. Um, that has happened before where when they get backlash over something, then they said, okay, well, let's go ahead and give this the best screenplay. Um, so that could happen. Um, yeah. And let's do uh, last one here. Original screenplay, Anatomy of a Fall, The Holdovers, Maestro, May, December, Past Lives. I think The Holdovers uh, has this one. I, yeah. I really just seeing the the list is, is I heard May December was great, but I also heard it was polarizing for a lot of people. I think Meister was on there because it has to be. Um, it's it is a it's a good movie. I don't think it's best screenplay good. Um, I think the holdovers is so unique and and just so solid uh, in what it is. I, th- I think that one is a lot. Well, the writing for holdovers is just is outstanding, yeah. and yeah. I think that. Uh, it's probably not going to win for best picture. If it doesn't, I think it's going to get the best screenplay for sure. Yeah, there um, there are times that movie feels like a documentary almost. Like yeah. you're you're sort of watching people live in this world. Um, I, I think it does something that the other films just don't do. Yeah, and with Maestro, it goes back to what you were saying. I I completely agree with this. Is that technically it's uh, it's gorgeous. It's beautifully made. The cinematography, yeah. the black and white. I mean, when the opening shot where it was mainly just silhouettes, I mean, it's mm-hmm. it looks absolutely gorgeous. And I think I texted you that after I saw that, that, that this is a gorgeous looking movie. But like you, I don't think it deserves best movie or best director. Uh, maybe, maybe best cinematography, but, and I neglected to put I, that up there, best cinematography. But I think Oppenheimer will win for best cinematography, but if Maestro won... I wouldn't be disappointed, and I think it would deserve it. I think it is a, a visually stunning film. 100%. I agree. I agree. Well, let's go ahead and wrap this up. We've been on here for an hour and 35 minutes. Um, it was great having you on again, uh, again and we have to have you on um, more often. Um, and thanks. Uh, let's go through some. Is, were there any questions here uh, that we missed? 
I'm trying to go through here. <laughs> John Pimmel says, <laughs> uh, Evil Dead Rise was snubbed. I'm only partially kidding. <laughs> I love the Evil Dead series, and I watched that one. It was like a, it was late at night. It was on a whim, and I threw it on. It had just hit HBO or, or Max. And I threw it on, and I was, like, enthralled for two hours. <laughs> I was so captivated by that film. It is so good. And, you know, it's it's rare for me to get into a horror movie where I actually rap about the characters and, and everything going on. Very rare. And I just, like, I it is so rare. And I fell into that movie, and I absolutely love it. I've never seen a bad Evil Dead movie, and that was probably one of the best. Yeah, I still haven't seen Evil Dead Rises. I think it's on Max right now, which... I hate. Yeah, I hate it, it that see, they. It is on Max. See it if you can. It's so worth it. Which I hate that they changed it to Max, but that's a whole different subject. Oh um, God, we could go. We could do a whole other hour and a half on that. <laughs> uh, John Pimble says uh, uh, Oscar highlights a a small number of new films, and I like when it benefits lesser known titles. But an awards cycle reminds me most of my favorites in the, my library never received an award or nomination. Mm-hmm. Oh, a hundred percent. There are so many fantastic classic films that never even got any recognition in, in awards. Um, Look, the, the the to me the 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 biggest snub in Oscar history was um, nineteen fifty the nineteen fifty five Oscar ceremony where Grace Kelly won for Best Actress for the movie The Country Girl. No one saw that. No one knows that movie today. Where very few people do, but she I beat do. out Judy Garland for A Star Is Born, in what is, in my opinion, one of, if not her best performance of her career. Maybe Nuremberg Trials, um, but that movie, her performance in that movie is bar none. A, the best version of that film that has ever been made, and B, the best performance of that role ever done. Um, and the fact that she lost to to Grace Kelly, to Princess Grace. Look, Grace Kelly was a good actress. I don't think she deserved deserve the act, uh, uh, the best actress win for that. And it was so egregious that Groucho Marx wrote to Judy Garland after the ceremony and said, "This is the biggest th- this is the biggest theft since Brinks, the uh, <laughs> the 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 theft of the Brinks Bank." Um, you know, it was it was just unbelievable. And I agree, like the, the and and you know to to speak. To to that point that our favorite movies don't always get the win a star is born is one of my favorite movies judy that's one of my favorite judy garland performances yeah and she didn't win the oscar for it yeah or or even nominations i mean i'm sure we've all been there where we're watching one of our favorite films classic classic film and we're looking well we look on your phone wait a minute this wasn't nominated for anything i could have sworn it was at least nominated for best picture and it happens um and you know, and it goes back to where you said greasing the wheels. It, a, a lot of it does, yeah. unfortunately, depend on. Okay, I mean, studios have budgets set aside for campaigning for Oscars. For, you know, hey, let's you know, we're gonna give you this for that. Um, and it, it, it unfortunately, it happens. Uh, one more comment here, and then we'll we'll head off it as a sexy boy, fifteen oh five. Uh, so this, this goes back to when we're talking about physical media, maybe with all these articles, maybe Disney can real, can finally dig into those 20th century Fox and touchstone catalogs and bring us restorations. One can only hope. Now, originally I would have said there's no chance on that, but then Disney released Mandalorian, um, Loki and WandaVision on, on 4k, which mm-hmm. f- completely floored me. I never I thought surprised. that would happen. Yeah, I was I was just floored by that. So it may happen. I know. I believe in the UK, um, it's called is it called Stars, where it's their Fox Channel. Disney released a separate. I think it's I think it's called Star, Star there. Yeah, yeah, where that's where you find all the more adult content, like um, you know, Fox and Touchstone right. movies, and uh, a lot of them are in 4K. So the the 4K master is out there. But it's like, is Disney going to spend the money to actually invest in, you know, um, reproducing it for on physical media? That's the big question. Disney, it's surprising and it's not because Disney, in, in, in a world where streaming services aren't really on, on Blu-ray or 4K or anything like that, it makes sense, you know, to not 
do that. But Disney has a long history of wanting to sell you shit. So they have the the Disney Movie Club, which I used to be a member of, and then it got too expensive. But, you know, for 30 bucks a month, they'll send you whatever the hot new DVD is in their catalog. Yeah. Um, and they are more than happy to do that. They just came out with like a $2,000 Blu-ray set of like every movie they ever made. Um, yeah. And I wanted it so badly. Yeah. Uh, but they, you know, they are more than happy to make stuff to sell you. And they know that a, a big part of their their market is collectors. So, you know, they, they came out with these steel books for Loki and WandaVision and stuff because they know the people buying them aren't necessarily the parents buying it for their kids. It's the people like you and me who are put, buying it. Into their um, and so it makes perfect sense to me that Disney would put stuff on disc and sell it. Well, and that goes back to what I was talking about, uh, this uh, producer friend of mine, and he talked about uh, um, physical media. And, and he, he, was, he was saying, you know, studios know there's value in physical media. Studios don't want physical media to disappear. They still see it as, as value, but it's also about convenience and again your your bankroll, you know, because it costs them nothing to put stuff on streaming. But if there's enough people out there that want it, they're going to put it out sooner or later. Well, and I, you know, we seem to forget that physical media sales are what brought Family Guy back from the dead. Yeah. You know, when I was in college, that movie, uh, that that TV show got canceled. And then DVD sales skyrocketed, and they were like, oh, there's there's an audience here. Let's bring it back. And also, it's a legacy thing. You know, there, there's um, – in the theater, even if a show is doesn't last more than two performances, like famously, um, Merrily We Roll Along, the, the Stephen Sondheim musical, only lasted a handful of performances before they canned it. Um, but the one thing they did before the show was canceled was they recorded a cast album. And the cast album is what solidifies a show's legacy. It means that other people, teenagers in high school who want to put on the show for their year, yearly musical, can listen to that and say, hey, this is great. Let's get the book for this and let's do it. And then slowly that will bring it back into the public consciousness. So no matter what happens, no matter how bad a show is or, or whatever the budget, get the cast recording done and solidify your legacy. And I think that's yeah. what physical media has to do now. It has to solidify a legacy because as we've seen from David Zaslav and Max, if you, if it exists only on streaming, it doesn't exist. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you can't preserve a film on streaming for future generations. It, it's, it's, you just can't. Um, to, to, let's go through two more comments here and then, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, Tippet Kit says, Sound of Freedom, even though the follow-up articles of the real story should have been included, it was really well done and not in a shock value film. Yeah, I mean, I saw I saw Sound of Freedom um, and it was a good movie. Do I think it was a worth an Oscar nomination? No. Um, but, um, but it was well done and all the stuff people were saying it's about QAnon and all that garbage it was completely untrue it's not has absolutely nothing to do with it uh but uh, yeah it was it was a good movie i enjoyed it um john pimmel says here going back to physical media disney movie club is not presently selling 4k versions of mondo loki and wanda only standard blu-ray so dmc is kind of worthless that's, to me now that's so dumb of them too like why why limit it <clears throat> to blu-ray i get why I get why they would limit the default to Blu-ray. So with Disney Movie Club, do you have you done it before? No, I've never have. So basically, it's a subscription service. You pay 30 bucks a month and they just automatically send you whatever's next in the catalog. It would make sense to me if that if the automatic mailing was the Blu-ray version, but if you wanted the 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 4K steelbook or whatever or the just the 4K, you could go into your account and say, "Hey, I want the 4K of Mando and I want the 4K of WandaVision. Send those to me next." Um, but for them yeah. not to even offer them just makes no sense. Yeah. I mean, even if they say, you know, pay an extra 10 bucks and you can get in 4k people would, um, so your tidbit kid says, I think Kino might pick up the rights based on some insight. They might be open to a few, like they did with criterion for Wally. What right, uh, rights to what? I'm not sure what, what he was talking about there. Um, they also have a deal with Mill Creek that hasn't really matured, so we will see. Oh, Disney? Yeah, but uh, yeah, that's right. Mill Creek had a deal with Disney where they're where they announced they're going to start bringing out older titles onto Blu-ray. Um, but who knows? I mean, I, I think it's going to happen. But this stuff takes time too. It can't just be instant because they have to 
do a new transfers, so do new scans. So it takes time to do all that stuff and it, it gets expensive too. So just because something's announced doesn't mean it's gonna happen in a couple months after it's announced. It could take a, a year or two before yeah. it actually happens. Um, I would love to yeah. see a Criterion edition of Snow White. They haven't done it, right? They haven't done the Disney Snow White. Um, for Criterion, no. no. For Criterion, I, I think because they, they're so particular in what they choose. They did Wally. I think Snow White, you know, the first true Disney animated movie would be perfect for Criterion. Also Ratatouille, which is just a terrific film in its own right. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they're, I think because they just restored Snow White, Cinderella, and they they restored mm-hmm. a Sleeping Beauty all in 4K. So I don't think they're going to, they want to keep that for themselves. Um, yeah. is I, I, I their bread and butter. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're coming out with Sleeping Beauty soon on on. 4k uhd disc um but uh snow white and cinderella look are absolutely amazing in 4k um all right well let's wrap this up and uh again thanks so much for coming on harry appreciate it so we're definitely going to have you on again you. um like last time we said we could talk another four hours about this stuff <laughs> this stuff is just our passion um absolutely yeah tell, let's tell people if they just joined or get um uh, a um, refresher where can they find you so you can find me on tiktok at lobby intros i'm an instagram at lobby underscore intros i hate that uh you can also <laughs> find uh if you go to my link tree linktr.ee slash hc marks um i'm there as well and that's where all of my links to um my my tiktok my the books i wrote um those are available um you can find me there so yeah awesome awesome and Obviously, you guys know where you can find me uh, on social media. Uh, I, I think I go under Paul underscore Twin Flicks. Uh, and I'm on TikTok, you know, all, all the others, uh, t- Twitter, Instagram, uh, or I guess it's called X now, which I hate. Um, but yeah, go follow Harry. Uh, he's got some good content and he's always progressing on what he what he's working on. So guys, thanks so much for joining us. Um, Miss uh wife what what waif says thank you gentlemen was a great discussion i thoroughly agree with that thank you and uh yeah guys so we will see you next time as always keep physical media live and we'll see you on the next show and hold on here